There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the Word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4, Includes Study Aids. Chapter 5, Gives a Suggested Bible Study Program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. In this lesson, we continue in our series of studies on authority. We're studying generic and specific authority. We begin, though, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples right before he ascended back into heaven. And he said this to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So we live in a time when we are under the authority of Jesus Christ, that he has the right to command, the power, the authority from the Father to tell men what to do, to be pleasing to God, how to honor God, how to worship God. He has the authority over the church, as Colossians 1.18 says, that he is the head of the church. And that means he can tell the church how to be organized, what type of work it is to be involved in, uh, how it is that we assemble and worship and when we assemble and worship. So the Lord, Jesus Christ, has all authority over these things. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, it says there that he is the blessed and only potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords. So Jesus is above all, has the right to command in matters of the church, has the right to command in our individual lives. Now, we can either submit to his authority and accept it and comply with his will, 
or we can reject it. In the former, we're going to honor the Lord by submitting to his will. And when we do not submit to his will, of course, we dishonor him. We disrespect him. We want to notice in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, that his will or his authority is expressed in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus is preparing his disciples to go out and to preach and telling them about things that they would face, both in the present time when he is commanding them and telling them about these things, and then later when they would go out and fulfill the Great Commission, he tells them this, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So, There's a chain of authority here. You see that Jesus says that he's sending the disciples out, that it is the apostles and people who receive them, people who listen to them, people who accept their teaching as truth, that they receive Jesus when they receive the apostles. And when they receive Jesus, they receive the Father. So you have the Father who sent the Son and the Son who sent the apostles. And the apostles go out and teach and preach his will. They teach and preach by his authority. And that's what we find in the New Testament, the authority of Jesus Christ. So we want to notice in Matthew chapter 7 then what Jesus says about this idea of the authority that he has and whether men listen to it or they don't listen to it, whether they accept it or not, whether they submit or they resist his authority. In Matthew chapter 7, let's notice verses 21 to 23, where Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, let's break this down a little bit. He says, not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord. So there are those who acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. They admit and accept that he is the Savior. In fact, in verse 22, Jesus says that these people that he's referring to not only acknowledge him as Lord, but they go out and they're very energetic, very enthusiastic in striving to please the Lord. So they're sincere people. But he said in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone's going to be with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in eternity who acknowledges Jesus as Lord, which, by the way, that tells us that just because you believe he's the Lord doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven, doesn't mean that you're saved. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Do you see that? Does the will of his Father. Well, what is the will of his Father? The will of his Father is expressed in the New Testament. The authority of his Father is expressed through the Word of God, through the apostles and prophets that Jesus sent into the world to declare the message of salvation, the the gospel, the doctrine of Christ, the covenant of Christ that we often refer to as the New Testament of Jesus Christ. That's the will of the Father. That's the will of Christ. That's the authority of of Christ. So when Jesus says he has all authority in heaven on earth, that is the same as the will of the Father. That is the message that's gone out. And Jesus says, not everyone who says Lord, not everyone who simply accepts him as the Savior is going to heaven, but those who do the will of the Father, those who submit to the will of the Father is the idea. And so we will either honor Christ in accepting his authority in our lives, in all things that we do, including what we do as a congregation and how it is that we would worship him as a church and what we do in our individual lives. And so we want to know and understand 
the authority of Christ, the will of Christ, and realize that this is a very serious subject, of course, because weighing in the balance is our eternal destiny. So let's study about the authority of Christ and let's look into the Word of God to to understand how to establish authority. When we examine the Word of God, we will see how authority is established. And in this particular lesson, we want to notice how to establish authority either by generic authority or by specific authority and what those mean and how those apply in our life. And we're going to begin by going back to the Old Testament and notice by way of illustration and example, authority as it's related to the Passover, and then we'll come forward in the New Testament and make an application for us as to what we are to do in authority or respecting the authority of Jesus Christ. So come back in just a moment and let's continue our study on the subject of authority. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. All right, so now we want to go a little bit deeper on this idea of generic and specific authority and look at the Bible and how It applies within the Word of God, and then, of course, we're going to make application to ourselves. But we begin by going to Exodus chapter 12, and we want to notice principles of authority as it is expressed in the Passover and the commands that are given, the observance that the Lord tells the ancient Israelites that they are to do or how they are to observe that Passover. And we want to back up and just remember what has led up to this point. You have the Israelites as slaves down in the land of Egypt, and they were under sore oppression. God sent Moses to deliver them out of that oppression. And when he sent Moses to deliver them, of course, then you have the plagues that unfold over time. And eventually you have that last plague, the final plague of the death of the firstborn. And when that took place, then Pharaoh and the Egyptians drove the Israelites out. They compelled them and wanted them to leave and to get out. Now, as all of that's unfolding in Exodus 12, we have a detailed account of how it is that the Israelites would avoid being struck with that tenth plague. They would avoid the death of the firstborn. And we want to notice these details in here and understand the principles of authority that are at play here. So we begin in Exodus 12. We're going to read a little bit longer of a passage here, verses 1 through 14, and then we'll begin to pull various aspects out of this passage. So Exodus 12, verse 1 says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw 
nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. Now you shall let none of it uh, remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when you strike or when I strike the land of Egypt. So this shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it at, as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So you see how the instructions are being given here. And there's a lot of different details that are given, and that's what we want to go through and notice how does authority apply here? How do they know what it is that they are to do within these things? And it will just help to illustrate the principles of both generic and specific authority. So to begin with, let's notice that there is generic authority in the idea of the various things that he tells them to do. He tells them to take a lamb from the flock. And when he tells them to take the lamb of the flock, there's nothing specific there. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. He says to keep it until the 14th day. Then he says to take the blood and put it on the lintel and the doorpost. He tells them to eat of the lamb once they slay it, once they cook it, and how that they are to dress. They're to have a belt and sandals and staff and different things like that. So he gives them all these various commands related to the Passover, and we want to notice that there is some generic authority within these. And this idea of to take this lamb, he doesn't specify who it is that is to take the lamb. So it could be the father of the household that goes out and gets the lamb and ties it up on the 10th day to keep it until the 14th day, or they uh, somehow have that lamb there for those days in preparation for the Passover. It could be the son who takes it, or the daughter, or a servant that they send to get the lamb. But he just simply says, again, to take the lamb and that's it. So who it is that goes to take the lamb is open. But what's not open for them to decide to do or not to do is whether or not they take a lamb. They have to take a lamb. But then also let's notice that it says to keep the lamb. Now, whether they tie that lamb up with a rope or whether they put the lamb in a pen or whether they have some other kind of shelter or way to to control that, uh, whether they have it sheltered or not sheltered, whether it's out in the open or, you know, inside of a structure. However that may be, he just simply says to take the lamb and to keep it, take it on the 10th day, and then you keep it until the 14th day. He goes on to point out that you are to have a belt. Now, he doesn't say what kind of belt that is, whether that's a leather belt or it's a rope, whether it's very wide or it's thin. He leaves that open to them to decide what type of belt, if you will, but he just says, have a belt, put a belt around your waist, uh, similar to the sandals, whether it's leather or whether it's woven of some type of material or whatever it might be, just put sandals. Then he says to have a staff. You know, does that staff need to be three feet, four feet, five feet? It's not designated. It's not specified in there. Should it be of oak or poplar or hickory or some other type of material, some other type of wood? You know, that's not given here as to what the staff is to be made of. So you have what we would call generic authority. 
We know they're supposed to take a lamb. They're supposed to keep that lamb. They are supposed to have on belt and sandals, and they're supposed to have a staff and all those things. But there's some leeway, if you will, within those commands. So that's why we call it a generic command. Now, there are also specifics within these commands, specifics that we want to notice as we go down through here. First of all, he says that the lamb is to be without blemish. Notice again, Exodus 12, verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So, uh, a um, lamb that is without blemish. What does that mean? That means they could not take a lamb that has a blemish. So when it was specified to get one without blemish, if they had a lamb that was missing an eye or it had a, um, you know, maybe a, a, a leg that was turned the wrong way or it was sick in some way, they're not to take that lamb but they are to get the lamb without blemish. And then he also said to take the lamb that is a male lamb. So what does that mean when he specifies male? That excludes automatically female lambs. And then he says to take the lamb of the first year. That means all other ages are excluded. If it's the second year, the third year, if the, if the lamb's four or five years old, you cannot take that lamb. So there's specifics here to take a lamb that is without blemish, a male of the first year. So there are very definite things or very definite conditions for this. Now, he says you can take it from the sheep or the goats. That means you can't have a donkey and use that as a sacrifice, or you can't take one of the cattle and use that as a sacrifice, even though the cattle might be a male of the first year without blemish. You can't do that because he says you take a lamb from the sheep or from the goats. So there's specific authority here in the type of animal that they are to take. Now he says, that this month is the first month. So this is the beginning of months for them. So when they were to observe it in the years to come, they were to do this in the first month. So it's the 14th day of the first month. They're to take the lamb on the 10th day and hold it until the 14th day when they would slay it, they would cook it, they would eat it. That would be the day of the Passover. So there's specifics there. They could not do this in the second month. They were not to do it on the 15th day or on the fifth day, but they were to, to do it in the first month on the 14th day. So there's an exception. Let's understand that it's given to that over in Numbers chapter 9. If you just want to make a note of this, we won't go very far into this other than to say that in Exodus chapter 9, verses 6 to 14, there's a case that arises where there were men who were unclean when the Passover was observed. And the Lord had to be petitioned to explain to them, what do we do in a case where someone's unclean? Can they not observe the Passover at all. And essentially what he tells them is that they are to observe it then, those who missed it the first time, to observe it in the second month. So he made a very specific provision for an exception. But other than meeting that exception, they could not observe the Passover under their own conditions or their own rules. So they couldn't observe it in the sixth month, on the fourth day, things like that. But he says, here's when you do it, in the first month, on the 14th day, with one authorized exception specifically given by the Lord in Numbers chapter 9, verses 6 to 14. Now, as far as the, the food that they were to have, of course, it says there to roast the lamb, and it specifies don't don't boil it, um, don't fix it in some other way, prepare it in some other way, don't eat it raw, 
but they are to have unleavened bread. They were to get rid of all the leaven out of their homes, and so they were to eat unleavened bread, and they were to have bitter herbs, not sweet herbs, but to have bitter herbs. So God is very specific in the details that he gives here. And we understand then that when he gives these things, when he specifies a male of the first year, they could not take a male of the second year. They could not take a female of the first year. To do so would have violated God's will. When they observe what God commanded, then he said that the angel of death would pass over them and they would be spared from that judgment. So let's draw the conclusion. If they did something that violated God's will here, so if there was a household that took a lamb that had a blemish and offered the sacrifice, they would not have been passed over. If they had put blood on the floor instead of on the doorpost and the lintel, they would not have been passed over in the judgment. The firstborn in their home would have died. And so you go on down that list of specific things that God told them. If they did not observe that and decided to do something else, they would not have been passed over in the judgment. So that's the idea of generic authority and specific authority. And let's think just a little bit more about this and and really drive home the point that generic authority is inclusive. It includes anything within a specified class. So if they were told to get an animal, that would include all animals. If they were told to get a lamb from the sheep, that would include all sheep. If they were told to go and get wood, and it was just wood, that's generic, that would include all woods. So you could get pine or oak or hickory or birch or aspen or whatever, because wood is a generic thing. But then on the other side, when we think about things that are specific, specific is exclusive, if you will. It rules out other things. So again, when Male is specified. That means females are excluded. When it says a sheep of the first years is what's to be taken, all other ages are excluded. When there is a command in the Old Testament to make something of acacia wood, that means all other wood is excluded. They could not use any other wood. Otherwise, it would have violated the will of God. So I hope this lays the groundwork for you and understanding authority being generic or being specific. Generic includes everything within a class or within a grouping, and specific excludes things within a class. So it would be inclusive authority and exclusive authority. Now, when we come back, we want to make an application to a command in the New Testament, the command being the Lord's Supper. So come back in just a minute. Let's continue our study. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's now look at a New Testament application of authority as it relates to generic and specific authority. And the subject we want to study, as we mentioned, is the Lord's Supper. So let's open up to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, where Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and begin to examine this subject and make an application that maybe you thought of or maybe you haven't thought of. Maybe 
some of this is intuitive because some of these things that we're talking about relative to authority is just an inherent understanding of human language and how we communicate with each other and how meaning is conveyed within that language. So maybe some of this is intuitive, but we want to spell it out in the Word of God and understand why certain things are practiced or observed by people who follow the will of God and committed to the New Testament. So Matthew chapter 26, let's remember Jesus is observing the Passover here with his disciples, but we want to notice something in verse 17, then we'll jump down a little bit later in the chapter to verse 26, but Matthew 26, verse 17. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And the relevant thing we want to get out of that verse is it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that means the bread they would have on the table when they're observing the Passover and then when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, is unleavened bread. So that's a key point. Let's jump down to verse 26. 26, and let's read through verse 29 where Jesus actually institutes the Lord's Supper as recorded here by Matthew. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So here he has instituted the Lord's Supper. The first thing we want to note is that he says, Take this bread and eat of it. Well, when he gives them that bread, what kind of bread was that? Well, that was unleavened bread. Then he tells them to take of the cup, take of this fruit of the vine. What is that? Well, we understand what they had on the table in the Passover was grape juice. So they have the unleavened bread and they have the fruit of the vine. Now, let's notice also in Acts 20, verse 7. Acts 20, verse 7. And the disciples here are gathering together on the first day of the week. And it says that they observe the Lord's Supper, or as the phrase is shortened here, and it came to be known as in the breaking of bread. So Acts 20, verse 7, Now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So they have their first day of the week assembly, and one of the purposes of that assembly is to come together to break bread or to observe the Lord's Supper, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in what he had done for them. So let's look at generic and specific authority as it relates to the New Testament or to the Lord's Supper as revealed in the New Testament. So when they are partaking of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, you know, it's not specified how that element is to be delivered or conveyed to the people in the congregation. So you could have a glass container and used to be in a lot of churches that they had the small little cups that were actually glass cups and they were reused, of course. They would take them and wash them and and use them again the next week. Very tedious if you remember those days and keeping up with all of that. can be plastic. So nowadays, most places that I'm aware of they use a small plastic cup instead of a uh, glass one. And the plastic, of course, is discarded, is disposable. It could be metal. Um, The actual tray, if you will, that holds the little cups could be metal. It could be wood. I know of um, 
some who in the Philippines, they actually just have a, a piece uh, of wood that has holes drilled in it. And that's how they convey the, the fruit of the vine around to the various members of the congregation. Um, very often there is like a, a tray, almost a bowl type thing that the unleavened bread is contained in. Now that could be metal, could be wood, it could be plastic. Um, it could be any number of different types of material, different shapes, different colors, things like that, because that's generic authority. The container that's used or the instrument that is used to pass out the Lord's Supper, the unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, that's not specified. So that falls under generic authority. And it could manifest in many different ways. <clears throat> and all of them, <coughs> excuse me, would be acceptable. The order of service. So we notice in Acts 20, where not only did they break bread, but Paul preached. And you would have to assume that they also had prayers that they offered up. Very often we read about Paul singing with the saints, or we read about that in, you know, Acts chapter um, 17 or 16, rather, when he's with Silas in prison, and then he gives admonitions in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. We see where in Acts chapter 2, um, the apostles are gathered together, and they listen to the apostles' doctrine. They observe the Lord's Supper. They partake of um, they offer up prayers and then they uh, have the collection or the gathering, the offering, if you will, the fellowship as it's described in Acts 2 verse 42. So there's different parts or different acts, if you will, of worship. And what order those come in is not specified in the New Testament. So when he says to observe the Lord's Supper and he says to do it on the first day of the week, we have that example in Acts 20 verse 7, you know, you might observe the Lord's Supper very first thing, or you might uh, do it as the second thing, maybe have a prayer <clears throat> or a song or something like that, and then observe the Lord's Supper. You could do it at the middle, you could do it at the end of services, that part's under generic authority. Nowhere is that specifically spelled out for us in the New Testament and the time of day that that would be done. So this would go to the gathering on the first day of the week. Do the saints meet at 10 a.m. or do they meet at 2 p.m. or 6 a.m. or what, what time they assemble and worship together and observe the Lord's Supper within that worship it's not given to us. It simply tells us that we gather together on the first day of the week. So there's generic authority, you understand, within the Lord's Supper. But there's also specific authority within the Lord's Supper. When it says unleavened bread, that rules out all other kinds of bread. When Jesus was there at the Passover with the unleavened bread on the table and he gave it to his disciples, that meant that we are limited, we are restricted to unleavened bread. That's why if you've been in a service where there is communion that is offered, where the Lord's Supper is observed, with the exception of a few religious groups out there, you're going to see that it's unleavened bread. And the reason is because that's what the Lord used, that's what's specified in the New Testament. You can't have sandwich bread or hoagie bread, if you will. You can't use donuts. You can't have pancakes and things like that. You have to have unleavened bread. That is what is spelled out. Also, the fruit of the vine, which again is grape juice. That means you can't use water or coffee or tea or some type of soft drink or Kool-Aid or anything else like that. It is the fruit of the vine that is to be used. And people who use other elements in their attempt to observe the Lord's Supper are violating the authority of the New Testament. They're doing it without 
authority. They are lawless, if you will. So we understand that there is specific authority here in the Lord's Supper. There's specific authority with the day of the week, as Acts 20, verse 7 points out to us, that they did it on the first day of the week. That means that we cannot observe the Lord's Supper on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, any other day. You see, when it specifies through the example of the apostle meeting with the saints that they did this on the first day of the week, That means that this observance of the Lord's Supper is not permitted on any other day. We see no other day in the New Testament on which they observed this memorial to the Lord's sacrifice. So you have generic authority and you have specific authority in the New Testament related to the Lord's Supper. We hope that helps you to understand some of the principles behind what we are to do and what we're not to do, what we're allowed or permitted to do, but we don't have to necessarily, where we have some room to exercise judgment and varying with the circumstances and the the culture and different things like that. There's some room there to change things up, but there's also specific authority where we don't have a choice. It is exclusive and we must follow what the Lord has revealed because Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. And if we're going to respect that authority, we will follow that and submit to it in all things. And when we do that, we will be rewarded with a home in heaven. If we do not do that, then we will end up being cast off, being rejected, and we will lose our soul. So we hope that this lesson has helped to establish some basic information about the authority of Jesus Christ. And we hope you will continue to study with us. If you have questions, then please reach out to us. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. In this lesson, we want to look at the manifold wisdom of God as seen in the church that Christ established. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, it tells us this, To me who am the less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. And so when he tells us here that the manifold wisdom of God is made known by the church, he's not saying that the church declares the truth of God and makes God's wisdom known to the world, though that is one of the works of the church is to declare the gospel to the world. Really what he's saying here is that when you look at the church, you see the manifold wisdom of God because he talks here about how this manifold wisdom of God is known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. It's made known by the church to these principalities and powers. So the the angels even look at the church and see the great wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God, the many-sided wisdom of God. And so when we look at the church, it's like looking at a fine jewel, maybe like a diamond, and looking at it 
from different angles, the way that it's cut, the light as it hits it, reflects off of it, as it passes through it, you see the beauty of it from various angles. So the manifold wisdom of God, the many-sided wisdom of God is seen when you look at the church. And when we look at the church, we look at the church as revealed in the New Testament as it was originally conceived and established by God. That's the manifold wisdom that we want to examine. And we're going to notice it in four different uh, aspects. There would be more, of course, that you could look at and and see because it is truly um, a manifold, many sided more than four, but we're going to look at just four here. First of all, we want to know the church in relation to the world, and it is simply the idea that those who are saints of God are brought together as a church, or they are considered to be the church. And that word originally comes from a word that's a compound word called ecclesia, and it means ek the first part of it is out of, and the second part is to call, klesia. So it's the called out. That's what the church is, the ones who have been called out. And it was a general term used in the first century, but the Holy Spirit gave it a specific and special meaning when he applied it to the called out of God or to the people of God. When we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, we see this concept being explained here. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord is Christ with Belial, and what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So come out from among them. Come out from the false religions of the world. And in the first century, especially, he's talking about the paganism, the idolatry that existed in that ancient world and in Corinth, in um that region where they were very idolatrous. So he says, come out from among them, be separate from those people. And that's the idea, the concept of the church. And we are called out as Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 says to be transformed. It says we're not to be conformed to this world, to be, but to be transformed from the world. In other words, the people that God calls out of the world are to be different and distinct from the world. And the people of God are to be different and distinct in the way that they talk. They're not to use filthy language or coarse jesting or things like that. Um, they're to be called out and be different in the way that they dress, that they don't dress like the world around them. You know, the world dresses in a way that's very provocative and very suggestive and dresses in a way to draw attention to themselves, to um, get people's attention, to make think, make others think well of them. And the Bible is against that. It's not saying the Bible's against looking nice, um, you know, fixing yourself up and things like that. No, that's not the idea. But I think you can see in the world People dress to be provocative, to get attention, versus dressing decently, dressing nicely, dressing appropriately, if you will. Uh, One of the things we want to notice specifically that Christians are to be different in is they're to be different in their socialization and recreation, what they do for social activities, what they do for recreational activities. In 1 Peter 4, verses 3 and 4, notice how Peter addresses this. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. 
In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. When you look at what goes on in the world, you realize that people pursue these things in their social and recreational activities. When you're talking about drunkenness, revelries, and drinking parties especially, but also when you talk about lewdness and lust, there's a lot of the things that go on in the world that involve that lewdness and lust, as well as the drinking parties and the revelries and things like that. And he says, Christians don't act like that. They don't behave. They, they don't get involved in those things. They're different. They're distinct because they have been called out separate from the world around them. In relation then to one another, we understand that those who are part of the church are described as the house of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, notice verse 15 here as Paul writes to Timothy and says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And that idea of house is, of course, the idea of a household or a family. God, the Father, is the Father of that family. Jesus Christ is our elder brother for those who are in that family. And those who are in the family consider one another brothers and sisters in Christ. And you see that referred to and alluded to throughout the New Testament. And this family that you have is to be a family of love, having love and care and concern for one another, helping each other out through life struggles and trials and difficulties. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it specifically says this concerning love or having that attitude of love. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So those who are in the house of God, the family of God, they have this love toward one another that shows an interest in each other to help each other, to be a blessing to each other, to be there for each other in times of difficulty and trial, and to be there for each other to rejoice together in times of blessing and goodness. So you have the church being the called out, being described as the family of God, and then as far as a government, the church is described as a kingdom or referred to as a kingdom in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15, it says, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, that's sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords. When it refers to Jesus as a king, we understand that Jesus is is a king over his kingdom. And the Bible does not give us this concept that the kingdom is one thing and the church is another thing. Now, when you look at the people of God and it being described as the church, the called out, in one sense, it's a family. In another sense, it's a kingdom. You have the same one who is over the family as the same one who's over that kingdom. The same one who's head over the church is the king over the kingdom. Christ being the head of the church, Christ being the head of the kingdom, being king over the kingdom. Now, our king is an absolute ruler. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. So he is a monarch with absolute authority. He is sovereign. He is potentate, as 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 said. But what we want to understand is that our sovereign, the potentate who rules with absolute authority over his kingdom, 
is not a selfish dictator type of ruler, but rather he is a benevolent and kind and loving shepherd. As John chapter 10 verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So Christ is a shepherd over his people. So that would be another way as well as looking at the church as a shepherd over a flock of sheep. But we want to stick to right now this idea of the government of the church is a monarchy with Christ as king and then his people being subjects in that kingdom or being members of that kingdom, and he is a loving and caring and benevolent and sacrificial ruler over that kingdom. But then, of course, the church is also described as a body. If we go to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body and the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, as an organization and how members of the church relate to one another, it's described as a body. So Jesus is the head. So he's the one who has the right to give direction, to guide that body. And then the members are various parts of that body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that we are one body in Christ and members individually. And he talks there about, you know, being a an eye or an ear or a foot in that body and how all those different members in the body are necessary and valuable to the overall body. And so these various members do their part to contribute to the well-being of that body. So as you think about that, you think about the beauty of the church and the manifold wisdom of God that is manifest by the church. That as we look at the church, it declares the great wisdom of God. So we hope in going through these things briefly, it helps you to have a great appreciation and helps you to pause and reflect on God's plan of salvation and how establishing the church reveals the great wisdom of God. And if you want to be a part of that church, you want to learn more about that church, then please reach out and let us know. We will be happy to study with you about God's great wisdom. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's word and discover what he desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, The Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study and 
It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to that's word and sword dot com forward slash how to we continue now in our series of studies on denominationalism the history doctrines and practices that many of them have in common and we begin with this thought it is hard to believe that some people believe things that are so blatantly wrong, so blatantly false. That is, there are people who are religious who say they believe the Bible, who say they believe Jesus is the Savior, and yet they hold to a doctrine. They accept a doctrine and they teach a doctrine that is completely contradictory to the Word of God. For instance, there are people who say they believe in the Bible and believe Jesus is the Savior, but that Jesus was just a man, that he was not God. Well, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, we realize that the Bible declares Jesus is deity, that he possesses divine nature. He did before he came to earth, he did while he was on earth, and he does now as he is in heaven. Because Hebrews 1 verse 8, it says, but to the Son, he says, that is, the Father says to the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So the Father refers to the Son as God. So how could someone believe that Jesus was just a man? It just it, it baffles one's intelligence or it baffles your ability to, to comprehend that. You just can't understand why would they do that. Another thing that some people hold to is that there is no hell. In Mark, Mark chapter 9, Mark 9 verses 42 and following, we see where Jesus talks about hell extensively here. In fact, Jesus taught more about hell than any other individual in the Word of God. In Mark chapter 9, verse 42, But whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maim rather than having two hands to go to hell fire or go to hell in the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And he goes on to repeat that. So we understand the Bible teaches that there is a hell. Jesus taught there's a hell, that there is a place of eternal torment described as a fire that is never quenched. In the book of Revelation, it's described as the lake of fire. And yet there are people who say they believe the Bible. They believe Jesus is the Savior, but they reject the idea that there is a place called hell, a place of eternal torment. And you wonder, how can they say they believe both things when one is so contradictory to the other? Another one that is hard to understand is how people can believe Jesus is going to reign physically on earth, on a physical throne for a thousand years. Because when you read the Bible, there's no support for that whatsoever. You have to really twist and turn what's in the scripture to get to that conclusion. Just like you have to twist and turn to get to the conclusion Jesus was just a man or that there is no hell. You really have to do 
some, if you will, mental gymnastics to reach that conclusion. And the same thing is true when it comes to the doctrine of premillennialism and the idea that Jesus at some point in the future is going to return and rule and reign on earth over a physical kingdom. Because the Bible teaches that Jesus will never do that, that his kingdom is not a physical kingdom, not a worldly kingdom. And so when you study the word of God, you understand the conclusion about premillennialism is it's utterly false. It's a theory conjured and created by man, by the imaginations of man. And what we want to do in this study is test the spirit, as John said. Remember in 1 John chapter 4, he told us that we are to test the spirits, that is, test those spirits that are out there teaching these things. Don't just accept them when they teach them. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, if there were a lot of false prophets in the first century, certainly we understand there are a lot of false prophets in the 21st century. So we need to test the spirits, and we're going to test the doctrine of premillennialism on a few different points in our study together. We're going to look at, first of all, the definition of premillennialism. What exactly is that? And then we're also going to notice the promises that God made to Abraham and what premillennialism says about them, and then what does the Bible say about them. And the last thing we're going to note is a couple of prophecies from the Old Testament that the premillennial doctrine claims are unfulfilled, but we're going to see very clearly in the New Testament where they have been fulfilled. So grab your Bible, grab a notepad, make a few notes as we go through this, Call in and ask us questions, send us an email, ask questions, but be ready to study and to dig into this subject in a deeper way so that we have a better understanding. So come back in just a few moments and we'll continue our study. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's now get into some specifics about the doctrine of premillennialism. And the first thing we want to do is look at the definition as commonly taught among the denominations. And not every point would be agreed upon here, but I think as we go through this, you'll recognize a common message that is presented in pulpits throughout this country. But the definition of premillennialism, here's essentially how it goes that the Old Testament teaches that Jesus came to earth, that Christ came to this earth with an intent to establish an earthly kingdom, but that he was rejected by the Jews and that that was a surprise to God that he would be rejected by his own people. And so there was no earthly kingdom established, but rather that God decided in place of the kingdom, he would establish the church until some point in time in the future, the kingdom on earth could be established. And so the idea is that at some point in the future, that there is going to be this thing called the rapture when the faithful of God suddenly disappear from the earth. The temple is going to be rebuilt. The 
saints that are raptured will be taken up into paradise, and then there will be a period of tribulation on earth. Now, I recognize that there are various ideas about pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, everything like that, as far as some of these things that go on. But generally speaking, most people have this concept of the rapture taking place, of saints going to paradise, and then this seven-year period of tribulation on earth when people are given a second chance to believe in Jesus Christ. And then when you go forward from there at the end of that seven years of tribulation, they say that Christ is going to return, that there is going to be this battle of Armageddon, there's going to be a resurrection of the tribulation saints, there's going to be a judgment of the saints, and Jesus is going to establish his throne in Jerusalem and he's going to reign there for a thousand years. And at this same time when he establishes his throne in Jerusalem after the battle of Armageddon, all the Jews are going to be converted to Christ and Satan is going to be bound up. And thus, when Jesus reigns on earth, there will be this thousand year reign of peace and everyone on earth is going to be in fellowship with God and it's going to be glorious and and similar to the paradise that Adam and Eve lived in, in full fellowship with God and everything uh, is going well and there's no sin, no unrighteousness, no evil on earth because Satan is bound. Now they say at the end of the thousand years, that the wicked are going to be raised, they're going to be judged, they're going to be cast off into hell, the righteous are going to then be all taken to heaven. So that, in a nutshell, if you will, is the basic concept of premillennialism that is taught throughout this land. Now, what we want to notice, first of all, is that premillennialism contradicts the word of God because it denies that the promises to Abraham have been fulfilled. Let's go and look at those promises now in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, remember that God called Abraham and made promises to him as Abraham would be faithful and loyal to God. So Genesis 12, beginning in verse 1. Now to the Lord, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So there are three promises that God makes to Abraham here. And those three promises are the land promise in verse 1, that he's to leave his country and he would give him a land, it says in verse 1. And then he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. So the second promise is a nation promise. And the third promise is where he says, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that's referred to as the seed promise, because as he repeats these promises later, he says, in you and in your seed, all the families or all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So three promises that are made there. Now, premillennialism, the doctrine, says that these promises are yet unfulfilled And therefore, there is a time in the future when God is going to fulfill them. So the Jews, they say, have not received the land that God promised. The descendants of Abraham have not been that nation that God promised that they would be, and so on. So they say these promises are yet unfulfilled. Now, I want us to notice in the Word of God, the 
all of these promises have been fulfilled, and it is specifically mentioned in the Word of God that they have been fulfilled. So first of all, thinking about that land promise, let's go to Joshua chapter 21. Joshua chapter 21, and notice verse 43 beginning here. Joshua 21 verse 43. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he has sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. So the promise that God made regarding the land that he would give to Abraham and his descendants in Joshua, at the end of the book, after Joshua has led the children of Israel into the land of Canaan to conquer the land of Canaan, it says all those things have been fulfilled, that every word, not a word of it, has failed. So they received the land promise. If you fast forward to the book of Nehemiah, if you go to the book of Nehemiah, remember Nehemiah was after the exile when the Jews had returned from captivity in Babylon. They've gone back to the land of Canaan. They have rebuilt the temple or rebuilt the altar with Ezra. Uh, With Nehemiah, they have... Um, now rebuilt the wall, and they have a renewal of the covenant with God. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 and 8, notice what is said here regarding the promise of the land that was given to Abram or to Abraham. Nehemiah 9, 7, you are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words for you are righteous. You see how they affirm that God has fulfilled his promise to Abram? in giving the land that he had promised to him and to his descendants. So we see that the land promise had been fulfilled. And you can go through the Old Testament and search in detail and see how specific God is in fulfilling these things, where God had promised them these uh, cities of refuge, and he fulfilled that. He gave them a land in which they could be their own nation and to have many blessings and enjoy the fruit of their labors there in that land and really the fruit of the labors of others as they went in and possessed that land and took their vineyards and houses and fields and all of that. Well, something else we want to note specifically is Genesis 15, Genesis 15, verse 18, where God makes the promise again to Abram and tells him the extent of the land because some in the premillennial circles say, well, yes, they got the land, but they didn't get the full extent of the land. But let's notice this. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, it says, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt, to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites. And so he mentions various tribes that are within that land. But notice the boundaries from the river of Egypt, which is a river in the Sinai Peninsula. It says to the great river, the river Euphrates. And essentially what this is doing is marking out the southern and northern boundaries of the land that God would give to Abram and his descendants. Well, let's fast forward now into 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 4, and notice during the reign of Solomon, 
how that there's a specific mention of the territory over which Solomon reigned as king. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 21. So Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now, when the Bible in the Old Testament talks about the river, it's referring to the Euphrates. It'd be sort of like in the United States, if we talk about the river, well, everybody knows that's the Mississippi. So it's talking about the Euphrates River, which was the northernmost boundary in Genesis 15, 18. And it says that Solomon reigned from the river in the north down to the border of Egypt. Well, that river of Egypt on the Sinai Peninsula, that was considered the border of Egypt. And so God shows us very clearly the promise he made to Abram, the territory, the land, the full extent of that land was received and controlled by the children of Israel. And in Solomon's reign, there's a very specific mention of that to tell us God had fulfilled his promise. Now, the nation promise was fulfilled as well. If you go back to Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, and recall that this is the children of Israel as they are leaving the land of Egypt. In fact, they're being thrust out of Egypt because of the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians. And in Exodus chapter 12, verse 37 it says, Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. Remember that when um, Jacob and his descendants, you know, Joseph and the other sons of Jacob, the other sons of Israel go down into Egypt, they had about 70 people who went down into the land. And now it says when they come up out of that land, it's there are 600,000 men on foot besides children. So these 600,000 are men of war. So these are adult males of certain ages. And if you extrapolate that out to include children and women and men who don't fall under those ages as men of war, you have some say one and a half, maybe two million people here. This is a nation coming out and as they come out, remember, they go to Mount Sinai and they receive a law. So they have a population and then they have a law or a constitution given to them that identifies them as a separate people. And it has a judicial code within that, of course. So they are a nation when they come out of the land of Egypt. And eventually, of course, they go into that land of Canaan when the land promise is fulfilled. So the two promises that God made to Abram in Genesis 12, 1 and 2, to give him a land and to make him a great nation, we see were fulfilled in the Old Testament. The only promise that wasn't fulfilled in the Old Testament was the seed promise that in Abraham, in his seed, all the families or all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But when you get to the New Testament, you understand that's what it is about. The New Testament is about the fulfillment of that third promise, the seed promise. When you go to Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, and notice verse 16 here, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, where Paul writes this, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed who is Christ. So the seed promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The seed of Abraham in that promise through which all the families of the earth would be blessed was referring to the Savior, to the Messiah, who would come into the world and bring salvation, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's where that promise was fulfilled. So we see when God made the promises to Abram in Genesis 12, 
that as you read through the Bible, God was true to his word and he fulfilled that land promise and the nation promise with the nation of Israel. And he fulfilled the seed promise with the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. So yes, all these promises to Abraham have been fulfilled. And premillennialism, when it denies that those promises have been fulfilled, that God has fallen short, they deny the word of God. They deny the truth. They deny God's faithfulness to keep his word. And we'll come back in a minute and we want to notice some things about prophecy and two prophecies, particularly that premillennialism says have failed. But when you study the word of God, it tells us that they have been fulfilled. And so come back in a few moments and we'll continue our study. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's word and discover what he desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning his will and submitting to his commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4, Includes Study Aids. Chapter 5, Gives a Suggested Bible Study Program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. One of the big problems with the doctrine of premillennialism is the fact that it denies that prophecies in the Old Testament have been fulfilled when the Bible explicitly tells us they have been fulfilled. And they have to do this in an effort to make those prophecies apply to something that is still in our future. When in reality, having been fulfilled, those things are in the past. So what we want to do is think for a little bit about prophecies. And we want to think about, first of all, the facts related to prophecy in the Old Testament or in the New, for that matter. But we're thinking about Old Testament prophecies at this point. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, we want to notice this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So 
God was the one revealing these things in the Old Testament. God was the one prophesying about future events that would unfold. So when we think about prophecy, we're not talking about a man making a guess, even a well-informed and well-educated guess about the future. We're not talking about things that man said and the validity of them. What we're talking about is God's word. And when we think about this, what we're dealing with is the integrity of God's word, which is really saying the integrity of God. Did he or did he not fulfill the things that he said, the things that he talked about, the things that he revealed through his prophets in Old Testament times? One of the things we know about prophecy is that the prophecies of the Old Testament were there very often to prepare the world for Christ and his kingdom that was to come. If we go to Acts chapter 26, Acts 26, we want to notice verses 22 and 23 here. Acts 26, 22 and 23. It's the apostle Paul preaching here. And it says in Acts 26, 22, Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets And Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would be and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So Paul's saying, look, you go back and look at the prophets, you look at what Moses said, and I'm simply saying what they said. I'm telling you about the fulfillment of the promises and the prophecies that they revealed, that Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, that he would proclaim light to the Jewish people, to the Gentiles. So prophecy prepared the world for Christ and for his kingdom and specifically for the spiritual nature of his kingdom. If we go to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31 You remember this prophecy in Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31? Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The first covenant that he says that he settled with them or that he established with them when they came out of the land of Egypt was the Mosaic covenant, the Old Testament as we talk about, the law that was delivered at Sinai. Then he says, you know what, there's a time coming when I'm going to establish a new covenant. And we understand that new covenant is the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And it was a spiritual covenant. He says it's not like the old one. It's not the one with the physical things, but rather it is a spiritual covenant. In fact, when you go to Luke chapter 17, Luke 17, notice as Jesus talks about his kingdom here, there, there's one expectation of the Jews and Jesus corrects them in their mistaken understanding. In Luke 17, verse 20, it says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom, not a kingdom of this earth, but it is a spiritual kingdom within you. It's talking about the souls of men. And in Jeremiah, when he says their sins and their iniquities, their sins, their lawless deeds, I'll remember no more. It's talking about being forgiven of your sins in that new covenant, the new covenant sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament prophecies prepared the world for Christ for his kingdom and for the nature of that kingdom that it was and is indeed a spiritual kingdom. One other point we want to make here, and this is a very important point, that whenever we read an interpretation 
of prophecy by an inspired man, that is the interpretation. That is the only application. We can't go and say, well, it means something else. But when an inspired man interprets a prophecy, that is its proper interpretation. So, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 to 13, let's just read this about this idea of God's word, the revelation of God's word, things like that. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul is pointing out that the revelation of God, the mind of God, is something that's only known when God revealed it to men. And he says, now God has revealed that to the apostles and prophets. And what they're saying is the mind of God. So when, again, an inspired man interprets a prophecy and applies it to an event, that is its proper interpretation. Let's go to Acts 2 now. Acts chapter 2, just so we can understand this concept of inspired interpretation. Remember, in Acts chapter 2, you have the day of Pentecost. You have the sound of a rushing mighty wind. You have the cloven tongues as of fire resting upon the apostles, and they're speaking in languages of the people who are gathered there for the great feast of Pentecost. And that these people are amazed by what's going on. It's drawn this big crowd in for Peter to be able to preach to them. Now, I want us to notice Acts 2, beginning in verse 14. Just let's see what he says here. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Then he goes on, verses 17 down to 21, to quote from Joel chapter 2. Now again, let's not miss this here. Verse 16, Acts 2, verse 16. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming in the great and awesome day of the Lord." And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he goes on to teach about Jesus of Nazareth being the divine son of God. Now, think about it. Peter is saying that what was happening on Pentecost was the fulfillment of Joel 2 including the moon turned to blood and fire and vapor of smoke and all these amazing things. He says, this is what Joel was talking about. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2.16. So when Peter makes that interpretation and says, this is what he was talking about, we cannot come along and say, oh, it applies to something else. 
We cannot come along and say, well, this prophecy is unfulfilled. We can't change what an inspired man has specifically said. Here is the interpretation of the prophecy. Now, something else I want us to really understand is that when a prophecy was fulfilled, that was it. There was no other fulfillment, so it can't have a dual fulfillment. So here's the context I want us to think about. A prophecy in the Old Testament would either have to apply to the first coming of Christ or the second coming. It cannot apply to both. And if it applied to the first coming of Christ, and as premillennialism says, that it wasn't fulfilled, you can't then just say, oh, well, it's actually going to be fulfilled later. You see, that would undermine the integrity of God, the power of God. So when we look at this, we understand that it either a, a prophecy either applied to his first coming or his second coming, but it cannot apply to both. Now, we're going to come back in just a moment. And we're going to look at two specific prophecies from the Old Testament that the premillennial doctrine denies they have been fulfilled, tells us that they are yet in the future, but we're going to notice in the Word of God how that they've both been fulfilled. And what it shows us is the doctrine of premillennialism is a false doctrine. So come back and let's study some more. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Three zero zero nine. Let's now look into the Word of God and notice a couple of prophecies that the doctrine of premillennialism specifically says have not been fulfilled, and we're still waiting for them to be fulfilled at some point in the future. So let's go first of all to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. And the claim is that this prophecy applies to the future. At some point in time, when Jesus is going to come back and set up an earthly kingdom and rule and reign on a throne in Jerusalem. Well, Psalm chapter 2, or Psalm 2, rather, I should say. Psalm 2, let's read verses 1 through 9. Just get the, the psalm here. And then we'll begin to look at its fulfillment. In Psalm 2, verse 1, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them with the pieces to pieces like a potter's vessel. So we're told in the premillennial doctrine, that that applies to some point in our future when Jesus will return and establish a kingdom on earth, that he'll have that battle of Armageddon, and he will rule and reign from the throne of David in Jerusalem, and then have a thousand years of peace. Well, let's look and notice that in the New Testament, Inspired men of God tell us that that prophecy from Psalm 2 was fulfilled with Christ's advent into this world and his sacrifice 
on the cross and his establishment of the kingdom, his kingdom, that is the church. In Acts chapter 4, let's notice verses 24 to 28 here. Acts 4 verses 24 to 28. This is the apostle Peter preaching here. Acts 4 verse 24. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, that's Peter along with other saints in Jerusalem here as the congregation is gathered uh, in the midst of them being persecuted. But notice the point being made here. So they quote from Psalm 2, and they say this has been done to Jesus just exactly like you purpose to do. It was part of God's plan of salvation. So they're saying Psalm 2 was fulfilled. Now let's jump to Acts chapter 13. Acts 13, and notice where the apostle Paul mentions that Psalm 2 has been fulfilled. In Acts 13, verse 31, beginning, He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you, glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You see, both with the apostles in Jerusalem in Acts 4 and with the apostle Paul here, they claim and they tell us that Psalm 2 has already been fulfilled. And what that means is we are not looking for its fulfillment in the future. We look to the past and see where it has already been fulfilled. We see where God kept his promise. We see God's great wisdom in working out that plan of salvation. And so we are thankful that he sent his son to this earth to die for our sins. Now, premillennialism also says that Psalm 132 Verse 11 is unfulfilled. So let's go to Psalm 132. Now, as you're turning over there to Psalm 132, they say that the language of the Old Testament must be taken literally. And it is only literal. And that's the only way that it can be taken. Otherwise, God deceived his people. And so they go to Psalm 132 in verse 11, and they say, see, here is a, is a prophecy that is made that is a literal thing that God's talking about, and it's not been done yet, and so it has to be fulfilled in the future. Well, Psalm 132, verse 11, the Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set up your throne, the fruit of your body. So they say, okay, he's prophesying that there's going to be the throne of David on which a descendant of David, the fruit of his body, would rule and reign. And so that's not been fulfilled as God made this promise, but he said literally that he's going to sit on David's throne. So that's why they say Jesus is going to come back in the future, sit on the throne of David, literally that exact throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign for a thousand years. Well, if we go to Acts chapter 2, again, this is the day of Pentecost when Peter is preaching to the Jews who have gathered there from many nations under heaven. In Acts chapter 2, 
Let's read verses 29 to 32 and just see what Peter says about this. In Acts 2, verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you, the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Okay, there's the prophecy, right? Psalm 132, verse 11. That God swore with an oath to David, the fruit of his body would sit on his throne. Peter's saying, you remember that prophecy. Now, verse 31, Acts 2, verse 31. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. See, he's pointing out that God fulfilled that promise to David in raising Christ from the dead. And he's now sitting at the right hand of of the throne of God. Jesus is now ruling and reigning in heaven. The Bible tells us that he is now king of kings and lord of lords. Not he's going to be, but he is. And so if we believe Jesus is king of kings, then we have to reject the doctrine of premillennialism, recognizing that it is not supported by the word of God. It contradicts the word of God. Now, there's one other that we do want to go on and notice in Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Premillennialism teaches that the sure mercies of David have not yet been realized, that they've not been fulfilled. In Isaiah 55, verse 3, this is where Isaiah makes mention of it. Incline your ear and come to me, hear and you sh- your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. They say, well, the sure mercies of David have not been fulfilled yet. But again, let's go to Acts 13. Acts 13, this is the Apostle Paul preaching at Antioch here. In Acts 13, and let's pick up in verse 33. Acts 13, verse 33. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Isaiah 53, or 55, verse 3, right? So he says, God raised him up, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken this, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. He says it's been fulfilled. It's done. So God has given the sure mercies of David. What are those sure mercies of David? That is forgiveness through Jesus Christ. We understand that has been fulfilled. There is not a prophecy of the Old Testament that God has made that failed because that's the position of premillennialism that God made those prophecies concerning Christ and it was supposed to all be fulfilled at his first advent into this world. But because the Jews rejected him, all those prophecies were delayed and put off to the future. You know what that is? That's prophecies failed. If God said they would happen when Christ would come the first time and they didn't, That means God failed, and he did not keep his promises. But we understand that's not true. God is true. God is righteous. God is all-powerful. God has integrity, and God did exactly what he promised to do. He did not fail in keeping his promises. So as you think about premillennialism, 
you understand that it's hard to believe that people would accept a doctrine that is so contrary to the Word of God and really undermines the integrity of God's Word and the integrity of God Himself. So we call on you, and I know this is difficult for some people, especially if they've been raised all their life to hear these theories of men and the idea that there is this great battle of Armageddon coming, that there is this great war that's in the future, and there's the all these signs that point to these things that are happening. If you've been hearing that all of your life, it's a challenge to sort through what is it that I've been told that is true according to God's Word, and what is it I've been told that is not true? And so we would be happy to study further with you. And we encourage you to continue to to study on your own and read the Word of God and test the spirits, whether they are of God. Test what we've said according to the Word of God. And reach out to us and let us know how we can help you to have a better, deeper understanding of the Word of God. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible. So you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning his will and submitting to his commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth, Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, You can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to.